guys, there's nothing better than being in God's house in the morning. It's always an exciting and a fun place to be. So can everyone, on the count of three, say warrior. One, two, three. Warrior! Oh, I love it. You got. You guys are awesome. Well, we're opening up this new series called Warrior. Um, what we want to do is we want you to navigate the new year, 2020, like a ninja. That's right. You don't have to study a ninja. We're going to study the scriptures and see how a lot of these brothers and sisters were a lot like ninjas. Now, it was a TV show called American Ninja Warrior. It has become so popular, a reality TV show. Um, but one of the most interesting things that I have found about that show is that they can't all win. You can't always win in life. Isn't that right? Just like they take on a course, there's only one winner sometimes. And so you might be the runner up, you might be the third, you might be the fourth, you might be this close from winning. You went through a battle, you trained, you did everything, and you just miss out and you don't always win. Now we all wanna be winners. Today I've entitled my message, Winers to Winners. Now I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be a whiner. I have no interest in being a whiner. Their success for the American Ninja Warrior depends on some different things. Um, their moves, every decision they make. Now, there's a lot of things they have to go through. But one of the things, when they're getting ready to make a move, many times they have to make sure they're planted firmly before they make that move. The second thing they need to do is they have to be careful with the degree that they tackle the challenge that's step in front of them. They also have to be well prepared beforehand. So you're not gonna swing from a rope to a rope. You're not gonna make a somersault unless you've ever done it before. So you're gonna do and go through pre preparation. But one of the biggest things they have to deal with, that, mindsets. They have to deal with their mind because their mind is what will effectually cause them to fail often it's because their mindset, if you don't believe you can do it, you already have defeated yourself probably by 60 to 70% already. Now, I believe that this series over these next four weeks can be very transformative for your life. And I believe if you want a successful 2020, this will be a great step to begin to navigate your way through the 2020 season. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a teaching from the study of the scriptures from God's word. And it's about a story of turf taking and transition. It's about turf taking and transition. So what happens is we're going to go to the story today about Joshua. They're a new generation that's in the desert. You guys have all saw the Ten Commandments. So you know a little bit about Moses and how often that they walked around the desert over and over, how they made mistake after mistake. But here's what's interesting. A new generation is about to take the promised land. New generation is taking the promised land. Now what's going to happen is it's been 400 years since the Israelites have been told about this promised land, and they still haven't experienced it. And the last 40, they spent with Moses. But now things are changing. And they've been told that they're going to go to a place that is filled with milk and honey. God's blessing will be on their lives. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually kind of think God's blessing has actually been on their lives because he's been taking care of them miracle after miracle, even when they didn't deserve it. Kind of sounds like me. Even when I don't deserve it, God is good. God is good, even when I don't deserve it. Now, these guys, what they're going to do, the Joshua generation, they're going to take their Reeboks, and they're going to put them down. Okay, they're not really wearing Reeboks, but we'll just say that for the sake of what we're doing today. They're going to get their Reeboks, they're going to get their feet, and they're going to get planted, and they're going to hit the land, because they're headed for promised land. So they're going to go through a transition, a new season. They're going to experience now a new leader, because Joshua has been commissioned now to become the next leader. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump now into our text. So let's take a look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, 
For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have what? Success. Okay, so let's just talk about a few of these words. I'm not going to break each one down into the Hebrew here for you. A few of the words we will. There's just not enough time for today for what we need to do. But I encourage you to go in and study it and spend some time. Now let's talk about that word meditate on it. Did you know repetition was a part of the remarkable feature of the Hebrews? That was a remarkable feature. They would always repeat things over and over and over again. Do you know the best way to change behavior? is to create a small new habit that you do over and over and over again. Maybe God's saying something here. Let's continue. And then it says, not just meditate on it, but it says day and night. That means to diligently study. Diligently study. Remember, repetition, and upon all occasions, this is what you need to do. It means that you need to find God's will and do your duty. You hear me? You need to find God's will and do your duty. And then the next part, you know, we highlighted means careful to do. What is that? Action. That's your action. There's actions that you need to take. Next one, prosperous. Now, the early church, and I don't know what you have all followed, but the early church did not know anything of today's popular prosperity teaching. They had no idea of the prosperity teaching of today. Uh, Let's just say they may not have been prosperous in riches and in land, but they were prosperous in love. They were prosperous in fellowship with Christ and prosperous in relationship with one another. Prosperous does not mean wealth. And because God says that you will be prosperous and have success, does not mean that you're getting rich. So if you came today and you said, I heard this is a get-rich-quick scheme that I can get involved in at church, at Elevate, no, that's not how God works. That is not what prosperous and to have success means. Now, actually... The word, both prosperous and success, actually comes from one word in the Hebrew. The best pronunciation in English is taskil. Now, I don't have it up on the the board for you. This is what it really means. Have wisdom, and it makes you wise. Have wisdom, and it makes you wise. When you're prosperous, and you have success, you have wisdom. And see, wisdom is how a house is built. It's the beginning of it all. You need wisdom. And so this is what God is talking. Now, interesting, if we go further to the psalmist, when David is speaking, he says in the book of Psalms, in the first chapter, in the first verse, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, And his law, he meditates day and night. Do you see it again? It continues. Repetition. Over and over. Diligently study. He will be like, and this is one of the results, like a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water. So in other words, it's going to be watered continuously. And its fruit will be there in season, and its leaves do not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. What's that mean? That means he's wise. That means he's wise. God will provide. God will take care. That's what it's telling us. Now, I'm going to even break this up just a little bit more for you before we go on. This is so important before we go to this next step in understanding. To be prosperous and to have success, of course, does not mean to get wealthy or to make you the CEO of the corporation. The word specifically prospers in the book of Psalms is called parats, which means Break out. Prosperous, to break out, to break in, to break through. It's about breaking. Now, you stuck somewhere in life? Are you limited? Are things dysfunctional? Do you need to break out? Do you need to break out? Question is, are you willing to be a warrior? Because warriors will break out. Because warriors will fight. 
And they will fight again and again. They'll go back to the battle and back to the battle. They'll gain their rest and they'll go back to the battle. Parats, break out. I believe that you can have his promise. You can have God's power. And it's going to help some of us get unstuck in 2020. Unstuck. Can you say that with me on the count of three? Unstuck. One, two, three. Unstuck. Unstuck. All right, let's segue now. After 400 years of people of God, they're going to step into this long-awaited land. But there is an issue. There is a barrier between the people of God and the promise of God. Isn't there always a barrier to what you know you need to get to? So some of you, it's people. It's the people that are in the way. You know, maybe you're at work and you're like, it's that boss. It's this uh, co-worker. It's this, uh, may, maybe you're dealing with something and you're in investments and you're dealing with bankers that are difficult. You always feel like there's a barrier. The good thing is it's not up to you to remove the barrier. God helps you deal with the barrier. So this barrier is the Jordan River. We've all heard about the name the Jordan River, whether you follow the scriptures or not. But it's a physical barrier. It's a real barrier, and it's a wide river, and it's deep and flowing hard and high because it's flood season. Now, this is one of the most interesting things because they have to cross this Jordan River. They don't have engineers like today to come up with something really quick. They don't have months to be able to prepare to get over this river. They have to do it now. Now, they don't have a lot of time to build some type of quick boat to get across. And they're bringing two million Israelis with them. Two million Israelis are waiting to cross this barrier with Joshua. And listen, there's always going to be a barrier between you and the blessing. Whatever God wants to bless you with, in whatever area that is, there's always a barrier that is in place. And how you navigate that barrier will be the difference. How you navigate the obstacles are going to make all the difference. How a ninja warrior goes through those courses makes all the difference how they navigate. Like I said, just a slight degree off and they'll miss the mark and they'll fail. So how you navigate, we need to stop and think and not just keep shooting at it and shooting at it and not paying attention, not preparing. We need to start getting in the mindset of what a warrior does. So let's go to Joshua 3, 1 to 5. I just need something to drink. So by the way, if you're following us on Facebook Live, welcome. And I'm advertising for Timmy's. Maybe they'll give me some free ones. I should show them that uh, live feed, right? And say, guys, I, I advertise you all the time. Oh, okay. Joshua 3, verse 1 to 5. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to go through here. I'm going to take some notes. Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from the, set out, sorry, from Shittim. That's what it's called. And he came to the Jordan. And they lodged there before they crossed. And by the way, that is the annunciation. <laughs> so let me just take a moment here. The village, Shittim, it actually means morning of thorns. It was the 42nd encampment of the Israelis, the Israelis before they would go into the promised land. It was the last place that they would be. But earlier, under the leadership of Moses, everybody had wasted away every opportunity. They'd been complaining, making excuses over and over again. And they are outside of God's will. And they're stuck in a place called Shittim. Let me just say, when you're out of the will of God, you're in a place called... Just saying. Let's read on. Don't you love the Bible, man? Okay, at the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp. And they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant... The Lord your God, remember Indiana Jones? You get an idea of the Ark of the Covenant? Okay. If you didn't, you guys are going to go home YouTube. <laughs> okay. So it says, with the Levitical priest carrying it, there was four of them, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Why? It's like a GPS. It's how you're going to follow. So however, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubics by measure. 
Numbers were very important then. It says, do not come near that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. In other words, don't go ahead of us because you have no idea where you're going. And the previous generation continually did that. Now, some of you, maybe you're living or have lived in dysfunction. I know I have. And your life becomes limited because of that dysfunction. And you don't even know what freedom's like. And the Israelis did not know what freedom was like. They did not understand it. Even though they had been freed from Egypt, they had spent so much time, they had no idea, and it was a new generation. And they had no idea, except for the stories that were told. And so God's kind of setting up his GPS. It says, then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves. That means to prepare yourself, get yourself ready for something amazing, something wonderful God is about to do. It says, for tomorrow the Lord will do, do, he'll do what? Wonders among you. He'll do wonders among you. God wants to do something supernatural and special for you. This is a type and an example for us to follow. It was written for a purpose and for a reason. In the same way, some of us may be the first generation with Moses. Some of us might be the generation that's with Joshua. You know where you're at. Now, if you read the rest of chapter 3, you'll watch how God provides a supernatural passage Because this Jordan River is actually impassable. It's impassable at this point in time because of the flood season. But God makes a way where there is no way. And we will go back a little later to read a piece. Now I want you to think, the promised land, there's the city, and many of you have heard of the city of Jericho. You've heard about the walls that fortified it. So the wall of Jericho is up. They are fortified and they're safe. They feel that they're safe. Now, I'll tell you why they feel that they're safe. Because there may be two million Israelis on the other side of the Jordan, but there's a flood. It's fast moving and it's deep. They're they're not going to be able to carry anything across. And if they do, they got a big gated wall. They're not going to be able to get through. So what's happening in the preparation for this promise is God is doing the right thing at the right time, in the right place. It's all set up. We talked about it in our last Christmas series here. It's God's timing. It's his wonderful time machine and how he sets things up. So a couple things are vital if you want to break out. And I'm going to give you the first big piece that you got to remember this today. you got to adjust your attitude. You have to adjust your attitude. Man, our attitudes... And I'm just going to be candid here. Everybody, every one of us, at some point, have had to adjust our attitudes. And some, maybe you still need to work on an adjustment in your life. Because your attitude is probably the biggest issue from experiencing God's blessing. Our attitude. It's not our faith. It's not just a lack of obedience. It's our attitude. Now, interesting enough, if you think about the attitude, if you think about Moses and all the people that follow him, what was the problem? Attitude. It was their attitude. So what you have to do is you have to shift from whining to warring. You don't whine about the course. You war through the course. You prepare and you go at it like you are a warrior, like you are going to fight through this course. If I fall, I'll get up and I'll go again. If I fall, I'll get up and I'll go again. I will not stop. I will swing. I will break a back. I will break a leg and I will get back. I will get healed. And I don't care if I have to hobble across. I'm going to continue. One of the things that when I got married, my wife and I, we decided over 30 years ago, we are not getting married unless we will war for our marriage. We will war for our marriage. In other words, there's nothing that will come between us. And if something starts, we're not going to stop talking about it till we figure it out. There's no just sitting back and saying, oh, oh, we're we're just mad at each other and we're going to stay that way. In fact, we have this thing. The scripture says not to let your son go down on your anger between each other. And we look and we say, if we're mad at each other, we stay up until we deal with it. And you know what happens? We look at each other and say, I'm still upset, but I really want to go to sleep. Yeah, me too. And then we deal with it in the morning. Usually the morning deals with us because we're all better. Our emotions don't feel the same. 
and we're much better, but we talked about it before we did. We just didn't leave mad. So we need to adjust our attitude. You got to go from the attitude of a whiner to the spirit of a warrior. That's how we need to change. Remember, this only works if you're candid, though, that you got an attitude. You know, people say, you know, I'm not a negative person. I, I just say as, as it is. But everyone around you is like, he's negative. She is never going to find someone. You ever hear her negative attitude? All she does is this and this about guys. Well, she's probably not going to find anybody. Because the moment that guy starts sitting down and talking to her, all she does is complain and grumble and mumble. You might say, it's not a big deal. It's just the way I am. That's just who I am. It was who I created. It's part of my personality. And that's just the way it is. I have a critical eye. I'm just keeping it real. Well, you keep it real. And you miss the blessing because you're a whiner, not a warrior. Will you be a warrior? Will you approach 2020 and navigate it like a warrior? Because if you do, you'll think differently. So let's go back here now. Now, the preceding generation, the Moses generation, they did not get to touch the promised land at all. Now, could have been because of sin, could have been because of rebellion. It could have been the distrust. All those factors come in. But let's go to our next scripture because this really tells us the true reason. In Numbers 14, verse 26 to 29. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall, every one of you 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. So is it a sin to grumble, to complain, to be negative? You figure it out. All I can tell you is whiners don't get through to the other side of the obstacle. They don't get through because they continue to grumble and essentially they circle the same problem over and over again. My heart goes out. But if we could just see the light at the other end of the tunnel, if we just be willing to make that adjustment in our attitude, I believe God could do many things. Now, interesting, if you say, uh, how bad is grumbling? In the book of Numbers and in the book of Exodus, it's mentioned 28 times. 28 times grumbling and complaining in just two books of the Bible. God's not about to take a bunch of whiners to the promised land. Now, he'll take you to heaven. You're heaven bound. You can go all the way to heaven complaining and grumbling. But I don't know about you, but while I'm here and I'm living my life, I want to experience blessing. And I don't mean get rich quick blessing. I mean a blessing on my life that others look at me and I can make an impact in their life. I only ask God to bless me so I can bless someone else. I can't tell you the joy it gives me when I can bring blessing to someone else. My excitement, I feel blessed when I can bless someone else. Now, this is just the way it is. Some people were born crying. They grew up whining. They live complaining and they're going to die disappointed. That's just their life. But if they could adjust the attitude, just a slow, small pivot in their life, what could God do? So I want to be able to change that if that's you or you have a tendency to go that way. If that's not you today, well, we're going to get to another point in just a minute here. But I'm hoping that we can change this. That Because I don't know about you, I don't want to be a weenie. I don't want to be a whiner. I don't want to be a wimp. I want to work. I want to win. But by the way, I want to tell you, while we're entitled this message, whiner to winner, you're not always going to win. And if it's all about winning for you, then the next time you get hit hard on the jaw and you go down, you ain't getting up. Because you're not a warrior. You're all about just winning. Warriors don't always win. I believe God has blessed me in such a way because I continue to war. I wish I didn't have to war as much as I do. I wish I didn't have to, almost every day or every second or third day, there's something I'm warring against. You know, I head to work. 
something begins to happen. I'm doing really good. And then all of a sudden, my emotions get the best of me. And then I realize I got a war against this. I got a war against how I feel. Sometimes I do well, and other times I just fall flat in my face, but I get back up, and I go at it again. So if you got a win to keep going, at some point you're going to get knocked down so bad that you may not get back up again. And I'll, I'll tell you what I'd like to do starting in this series today. I'd like to make a new hashtag. Ready? Hashtag stop global whining. Stop global whining. Hashtag it. EC, stop global whining. We have got to stop the whining and the complaining and the grumbling. We all fall to it. And when someone else does it, you know, we say something small. Let's just walk away. It's not even worth warring against someone when they get to that place. But what if it's us? Even worse. Let's stop the global whining. I am so tired of a bunch of whiners constantly around me. It's so hard. I have to go find people who are warriors because they freshen me up. They give me zeal and they give me a fire to get up and do it again over and over again. So let's not be a whiner. Let's be a warrior. So let's not just look and say, change our attitude, but number two, make the right decision at the right time. Make the right decision at the right time. Isn't that beautiful? That's an outcome, guys. In case you didn't get it, you're like, okay, that makes no sense. If I knew the right decision at the right time, I'd be doing it. That's just an outcome. If you're paying attention, I didn't help you at all. You know if you make the right decision at the right time, you'll have success. Some famous leaders in our world teach us. This is one of their key points. But the difference is, is you need to know what that means and what that looks like. And you have to understand in life, there are certain principles and certain laws um, that are just a part of our life of timing. Timing, timing. And what you need to know is timing is critical. Timing is critical when you're doing things in life. And what you have to know is that God's timing is not good. It's perfect. God's timing is not good, it's perfect. And if we can align ourselves with God's perfect timing, if we can align ourselves with God's wristwatch on his timing, God will be able to make things happen in our life. But we got to work with him. It's not about our schedule. It's about his wristwatch of time. And so what I want to do is, in order for us to make our businesses better, our relationships better, our ministry better, we need to understand the right decision at the right time. So I'm going to give you four things today. The first thing is, do you have scripture or a word from God? Now you're like, oh, that seems quite simple. Let me break this down for you. Do you have scripture that is in the Bible a word that God has said in the Bible. Do you have a scripture word that God speaks directly to an issue? The Bible has all sorts of information. There's narratives, there's stories, there's examples. And by the way, those examples are very helpful. There's principles, there's precepts. The precepts are very helpful. But I mean, do you have a command that God has said? Do you have a command? Is there a thou shall or thou shall not? That's for you King James folk. Thou shall or thou shall not. Is there something that God commands? Is there a biblical imperative that maybe speaks to the issue directly in your life? Because if there is, you need to align your life up with what the scripture tells us. Begin to align it up. That's what warriors do. They get in and they diligently study repeatedly over and over again. Now let's go to the book of James in the first chapter in the 22nd verse. It says, but don't just listen to God's words. You must do. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourself. So let's not just look at the scripture and just say, oh, that's a nice thing. We need to take it and we need to mirror our lives around it. Don't just read it. It's just not reading and listening. It's in the doing. And by the way, if you want to see true healing in your life, it's when you begin to do what God says, not just read what he says. 
And blessing's not just the hearing, it's in the doing. And then God begins to bless your life because then you're in God's will. And when you're in God's will, then you just have to align yourself and you begin to see the promises and the blessing. God will speak directly into that relationship in your life. He'll speak directly into your finances. God tells you specifically about how to handle relationships. He tells you specifically about your finances. He goes in and he asks you to just align it up with his. Align it up with his word. Because God's word is always correct. It never misrepresents and it never lies. It's always true. So the right time, do the right thing. And also do it right now. You got to do. It's the number one criteria. So if the scripture says it, the word of God says it, just do it. That's a slam dunk. That's an easy one to know the right decision at the right time. You just do what it says. You guys with me? Okay, number two we're going to come to here. Now, here's the thing. There's lots of things that you're going to need to navigate in this year. Like, for example, you're going to have to ask questions that the scriptures don't give you. You know, don't you wish that there was something that, you know, for example, you could say, you know, God, do you want me to marry Eleanor? Lord, should I dump Bob? You know, I, I don't know why, by the way, I always pick on Bob. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's because there's so many Bobs. What about Bob? <laughs> uh, but you, you don't know. You don't have an idea. The scripture doesn't come out, thou shalt dump Bob. It's not in there. And so you need to learn. You don't have a verse, but you might have some principles. You might have principles, like maybe in the scripture it tells you what a godly man is and what a godly woman is. And look for those things now to begin to get to where we're going to go next. So sometimes what you need to know is that God will close a door. People call it the closed door theology. But what I like to say is, number two, today, your next point is, we get a stop sign. We get a stop sign. You ever get a stop sign? Don't you love stop signs? Stop signs, stop lights. Now, if you're like me, when God gives me a stop sign, I'm frustrated. They frustrate me. I'm like, God, did you realize I put so much work into this? I planned this. And now you're saying stop? Like, what's wrong with you? Don't you realize that this is a good idea? It's like, I'm telling God what a good idea is. He gave me a stop sign. But listen, I've learned stop signs are God's way of protecting us and directing us. A stop sign protects you and it directs you. But signs are there for your protection and for your direction. A stop sign's for your protection and direction and God puts a stop sign sometimes in your life for your protection and your direction. Let's take a look in Acts 16.6. It says that they passed through the Pygarian and the Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, when you look at this, you're like, okay, hang on. God forbid them. I call that a stop sign. Now, why would he do that? Does God not like Asians? Why, 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 why would he stop them from going to Asia? Well, here's the thing. Paul had already been there. In fact, they'd already planted churches and shared the good news already in Asia Minor, which is what we know today as modern-day Turkey. But God put a stop sign. And we go, well, why would God do that? Because he has something better. Sometimes a stop sign isn't just for your protection. It's also to direct you to a better direction in your life. And let me explain. Because what happens within 24 hours, Paul changes his routes and he heads to Greece. And they share the good news, the gospel. And when they get there, eventually it spreads to Europe. If you're of European descent, you should be thankful that he didn't go back to Asia. Because from Greece, it spread everywhere. I believe God had better things in mind. So he stopped what was happening because he has better. He protected us and he directs us when it comes to stop signs. But he doesn't just give us stop signs. He also gives us, ready for this, a green light. He also gives you a green light. You got to love the green lights. Now, the green lights are one of my favorite because I love a green light. But the green light does not mean an absence of obstacles. So when the ninja warrior takes off through the obstacle course, he gets a green light. 
But that does not mean he has no obstacles. He still has obstacles in his life. So don't think that it's easy sailing. That's why you need to be a warrior. So let's continue here because I want to see if we're all on the same page. A green light means... Right. You guys are good. A green light means go, but I think that's an impartial answer because a green light really means go now. Let me go back to that. Say the light doesn't turn red. We're at a red light and they're picking their teeth. They're on their phone trying to get the reception and the light goes green. The cars go in front. I can't go either way. Cars are going by me. I'm sitting here and I have a dilemma. Am I going to lay on the horn or am I going to beep, beep? I'm a Christian, so I lay. No, I'm just joking. Well, sometimes I do, okay? And then I'm sitting, God, forgive me. It's always easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so what means, a green light means go now. And you know what happens? So they go, oh, 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 okay. And they go, and they just make the green light before it goes red. And now I'm at the red lights for another cycle. You disrupt a lot of people when you don't go now. You don't just disrupt your life. You disrupt other lives. A green light means go now. You need to go when it's time. And a lot of times we don't recognize that a green light means now. Not in a while. You know, growing up, you ask your kids to obey you. You ask them to do something. And if they say later, that there's no obey later. That means you don't do it. It's obey now, not obey later. So when God gives you a green light, go now. Don't wait. Go. He's given you the green light. And you have to fight with that battle. See, I believe this. I believe that if the devil can't make you say no, he's going to make you say not yet. But even worse, he'll make you say later. Well, I, I, I don't know if I can do that right now. I got a lot of things going on in my life. But you got a green light. Go now. Don't hesitate. And even more, let's sandwich what we said in the scriptures. The scripture says now. The Bible says salvation. The time is now. It's not later. It's now. Do it now. That's what a warrior does. He just goes now. And he figures out the obstacles as he goes through the course. And then we come to our last one. And you need to put this down in your phones because it feels like the right time. Because it feels like the right time. So put that in your phones. Take your picture shots so that you'll remember this. And delete it. Delete it. Let's go to our next slide. Let's show you this. Because it feels like the right time, delete it. When it feels like anything, you need to delete it and say no. I found that when it comes to the call of God, I never feel like doing what he said. I never feel like doing it. Because my feelings are based on insecurity and fear. That's not God's promises. And see, and God's promises that he gives us and are about our potential and the blessing of others. God blesses you to be a blessing. I have news for you. If you seek the blessing for any other purpose than blessing others, any other purpose than fulfilling the will of God, it's not the same blessing of the scriptures. It's different. It's not about your feelings, and I guarantee you, the people of the Joshua generation did not feel like crossing over that Jordan River. Not one bit. Let's take a last look at our last scripture in Joshua 3, verse 15. It says, now the Jordan is at flood stage. All during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reach the Jordan, their feet, they touch the water's edge. They had to march out into the heavy flowing water. All four 
of the priests. And imagine as they stepped into the water and they're getting deeper and they're getting deeper, they did not feel like doing this. They did not feel like being a warrior here. They felt something else. They felt fear. Now here's the thing. Why would they feel like that? It's because they could not swim. They could not swim. Now I know you say, Evan, where's the text for that? Actually, it's not in the text. It's in the subtext. Because if you read all about the Israelites, they were in the desert for 40 years. And then they raised their children. There's no swimming pools, no rivers, no lakes, no seas, no oceans. They have never swam in their life. And now they're stepping into water that's going to be over their head. And it's at floodgate season. And God, of all people, in his miraculous timing, he makes, asks them to make the right decision at the right time. But he had 40 years to lower the waters and he sends them at flood time. He doesn't want them to focus on their feelings. He wants them to listen to his word. And he says, go. I'm sure in their minds, they had to war their faith over their feelings. They had to trust. And that's the big thing. In our relationship, as we follow after Jesus, we follow his way. It's about our faith. That's why it's called a faith. It takes faith to remove our feelings. But I don't know about you, but I've trusted my feelings far too often and they've let me down. They've hurt me. They've wounded me. But my faith in God has never failed me. My faith in Christ and what he can do and when he speaks to us. So, you know, we may be here today and God may have given you a specific decision to make at some point in time. But let me tell you, the right decision at the right time. And if God, excuse me, if God is calling you, he'll be there. And he'll part those floodwaters. He'll lower the flood. He'll be the one to make it through. And the key point you need to know is God needs to be able to show you it's him. So you know without a shadow of doubt and you don't take the credit for you being the one to do it. That's how God works. Father, I thank you, God, today. I thank you that you are a God of wonders and miracles. But Lord, all you ask is that we would diligently seek you, learn about you, study what you say to us, and just spend time getting closer and closer to you. And so that's what we do. But we ask God in our daily life as we go about, whether we're at work, we're walking through relationships, we're talking to people, whether we're uh, reaching out, we're sharing your news, no matter what we're doing, Lord, we need your guidance. We need your direction. And Father, I, I just, even today, I ask you to forgive me for my sinful ways. If that's any of us that's here today or if you're watching online, if that's you, you all you got to do is ask him to forgive you. Our sins are the things that have held us back, that separate us from who God is. And we just say, would you take them, Lord? You paid the price for our sins, and i got to thank you so much. And my payment is that I will follow you, and I will do everything I can to allow you to be the leader of my life. And we thank you. Lord, I ask that you would touch every life, prepare every life, God, may we become warriors, warriors of faith. God, that will stop whining and we'll start seeing some wins in our life. Because when you're a warrior, you're a winner. And we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.